Rabbi. A title which means acknowledged teacher. Raise up seed. Jacob 2, paragraphs 6 to 8 does not point to a justification for plural wives and concubines, which the Book of Mormon vehemently condemns, but refers to raising up a righteous branch, specifically from the fruit of the loins of Joseph. Or raising up seed unto the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me. A righteous seed are those who accept Christ as their Father, become the begotten sons and daughters of God, and who are connected with Him by adoption, affiliation, or association. Other instances in the scriptures where the phrase raise up is used is in combination with the following, a mighty nation. 1 Nephi 7, paragraph 3. One mighty. 2 Nephi 2, paragraph 7. A righteous branch. 2 Nephi 2, paragraph 2. A Moses. 2 Nephi 2, paragraph 5. A seer. 2 Nephi 2, paragraph 3. And a great nation. Ether 1, paragraph 4. When the term raise up is used in connection with seed, it is very specific. That is that they might raise up seed unto the Lord in the land of promise and raise up unto me a righteous branch. 1 Nephi 2, paragraph 2. For if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people. Jacob 2, paragraphs 7 to 8. See also the glossary entry, Seed of Christ, or Heirs of the Kingdom. Rebaptism. Believing in Christ precedes baptism. In fact, belief in Christ causes baptism. The one results in the other. Without faith in Him, there is no need for baptism. This then makes the first step belief in Christ, with baptism the second step. I've heard of those who obtain a testimony of Christ in adulthood, but who were baptized many years earlier at age 8. If belief in Christ is supposed to precede baptism, but in fact follows it, does that recommend repeating the ordinance? Does Christ's establishment of an order to these things, by the commandment of the Father, matter? If it matters, then why not try it? If tried and it tastes good, then you have your answer. And if nothing changes, then you also have learned something, as well. I was fortunate to be able to follow the proper sequence. I was 19 years old when I came to the truth. I try to follow the proper sequence with my own children by teaching them before baptism and testifying of Christ to them in a way calculated to produce faith in Him. I would take no offense, however, if one of my children were to later want to be re-baptized as an affirmation of their continuing belief in Christ. I can't see why anyone would take offense. On Sunday, March 20, 1842, Joseph Smith preached about baptism and re-baptized about 79 church members and at least one new convert. The first baptism was the convert. Wilfred Woodruff's journal records, President Joseph Smith went forth into the river and baptized with his own hands about 80 persons for the remission of their sins. And what added joy to the scene, the first person baptized was Mr. L. D. Wason, a nephew of Sister Emma Smith. Was the first of her kindred that have embraced the fullness of the gospel. On the next Sunday, Woodruff recorded, after the meeting closed, the congregation again assembled upon the bank of the river and Joseph the seer went into the river and baptized all that came unto him. And I considered it my privilege to be baptized for the remission of my sins, for I had not been since I first joined the church in 1833. I was then baptized under the hands of Elder Zero Pulsifer. Therefore I went forth into the river and was baptized under the hands of Joseph the seer, and likewise did Elder J. Taylor and many others. Wilford Woodruff's Journal, March 27, 1842 In these two journal entries one sees that re-baptism was taught and practiced by Joseph Smith, John Taylor, and Wilford Woodruff. If other contemporaneous records are consulted, it is clear that re-baptism was universal in the early days of Mormonism. One did not partake of the sacrament to renew baptismal covenants. They were re-baptized. 
The purpose of baptism grew from remitting sins and joining the church to include rebaptism as a means for rededication and purification, as well as rebaptism for the healing of the sick. Emma Smith was rebaptized in October 1842 for her health. Nephi had authority to baptize before Christ came. When Christ came, he gave Nephi the authority to baptize again. Nephi baptized a group of people, then he baptized the same group of people a second time. He rebaptized them. Rebaptism is a sound gospel principle and is practiced every time God sends a message. The correct way to accept and proceed is to renew baptism, just like the people in the Book of Mormon did. The Lord renewed this commandment for all to be baptized on September 9, 2014. He expects us to follow his pattern and obey this to receive a remission of sins. Even if you have been baptized previously, be baptized in this new dispensation. The Lord has renewed this commandment for our time and baptism is a sign of acceptance of what God is doing in each generation. He expects us to follow his pattern and obey this to receive a remission of sins. This baptism is not membership in any organized church or religion. It is a sign between you and God that you sincerely believe in Jesus Christ and wish to follow him. If you've not been baptized, or would like to be baptized again, there are those who have authority to administer this ordinance. To the thousands who have been rebaptized, this is a sign you are not an idolater and will not be destroyed at the Lord's coming. See also the glossary entry, Baptism. Redeem Jerusalem. To re-establish the promised heirs upon their own land and bring again Zion. And when the words of the prophet Isaiah shall be fulfilled, which say, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God, 3 Nephi 7, paragraph 6. In this profound insight and declaration by Christ, readers learn Isaiah was not speaking of the return to the Middle East for these coming events to unfold. Instead, the waste places of Jerusalem are nowhere near Jerusalem. They are in another place, far away, where the residue of Jerusalem's scattered people are wasted and then restored again. Waste places is plural. According to Christ's interpretation, they are scattered throughout the world. One is in the Americas, on an isle of the sea, 2 Nephi 7, paragraph 5. There is also something odd about this passage. After the removal of the Gentiles, there is joy, rejoicing, singing together, seeing eye to eye, and a return to Zion. This emotional setting seems at odds with what mankind anticipates. It would seem that destroying the Gentiles and experiencing the trauma of those days would produce mourning and lamentation. It does not. Instead, it produces singing in joy. Whatever bottleneck of destruction is needed to bring that triumph to pass will be worth it. So great will be the peace that follows that it will wipe away all tears. Truth, saving doctrine, and being fed by Christ's own message will end all laments, as described in Revelation 2, paragraph 16, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. From the blog post, 3 Nephi 16 verses 17-20, June 27, 2010. See also the glossary entries, New Jerusalem. Zion. Redemption. To be brought back into the presence of God. Ether 1, paragraph 13 confirms, when he had said these words, Behold, the Lord showed himself unto him and said, Because thou knowest these things, ye are redeemed from the fall. Therefore, ye are brought back into my presence, therefore I show myself unto you. This is the gospel of Christ. Eternal life requires all to know him. Ether affirms the brother of Jared was redeemed when Christ came to him. Christ redeemed him from the fall, because thou knowest these things, ye are redeemed from the fall. Christ defines redemption. 
Reconciliation comes through Christ, with Christ, and by Christ. He has the power to redeem all. The monetary metaphor is by far the commonest one for redemption or reconciliation, being the simplest and easiest to understand. Frequently the word redemption literally means to buy back, that is, to reacquire something you owned previously. Redemption, or atonement, restores one to a former, happier condition. By redemption, someone has paid a price to get you off. It is impossible to become altogether clean in this fallen world. Man can do his best, but in the end, he's going to find he is lacking. The scriptures admit this. The proposition is so fundamentally understood among most saints that it goes without saying, all are in need of redemption from an outside power, someone with greater virtue and power than man has, who can lift mankind from their fallen condition into something higher, cleaner, and more godly. This is the role of Christ. His atoning sacrifice equipped him to accomplish this. As explained by Alma, the redemption which comes from faith in Christ is what empowers one's repentance, so that he or she can take advantage of his atonement by forsaking their sins. See Alma 16, paragraph 34. This is a difficult process, involving constant attention to his mercy, which redeems all mankind. See Alma 16, paragraph 35. How humble it is for the Lord to be willing to accept the reluctant, tardy, and slow to repent. Nevertheless, he is willing to accept even them. He suffered for all and will redeem as many as will come to him. Ultimately, the outcome will depend upon how committed they are to the process of repentance, for to repent is to come to him. They decide if his open arms will be where they finally embrace him. The God of the celestial kingdom, in which man is presently situated, is the Holy Ghost. The God of the terrestrial kingdom, which the millennium will reflect, is Jesus Christ. The God of the celestial kingdom is God the Father, see TNC 69. The Holy Ghost brings man to Christ. Christ brings man to the Father. And the Father extends the promise of exaltation by making one a son or daughter of God. The plan of redemption brings men and women from their current, fallen state back to a state of awareness of their condition, and then by cleansing them, elevates them in light and truth. The primary God with whom men and women interact here in this world is the Holy Ghost. However, the association with Christ is promised by him in John 9. Joseph Smith explained that when the promise given by Christ, in that chapter of John, is realized, then the Father and Son will visit with the person from time to time. In a universal sense, modern revelation confirms that all will be redeemed, except the sons of perdition, see TNC 69, paragraph 7 and 24. And by Adam came the fall of man. And because of the fall of man came Jesus Christ, even the Father and the Son. And because of Jesus Christ came the redemption of man. And because of the redemption of man which came by Jesus Christ, they are brought back into the presence of the Lord. Yea, this is wherein all men are redeemed, because the death of Christ bringeth to pass the resurrection, which bringeth to pass a redemption from an endless sleep, from which sleep all men shall be awoke by the power of God when the trump shall sound. And they shall come forth, both small and great, and all shall stand before his bar, being redeemed and loosed from this eternal band of death, which death is a temporal death, Mormon 4, paragraph 7. The plan of salvation provides blessings and benefits for all of mankind, with the hope that all will be added upon here. Therefore, redemption reflects the adding of celestial, terrestrial, and celestial estates available through the atonement. The Holy Ghost is the instrumentality by which redemption itself comes. The Spirit is the guide which will lead back to the Lord's presence. Without the guide, the doctrine of Christ is incomplete. The gospel of Jesus Christ is true, authentic, and holds the means for redeeming mankind. Redemption causes the redeemed to work for the salvation of others. The reason some obtain the kind of redemption Nephi obtained is because they are of a character to work for the redemption of others. See 2 Nephi 15, paragraph 2. 
There is no reason to withhold the promise of eternal life from them, because others will be redeemed as a result of their redemption. They will labor, preach, teach, intercede, seek, pray, and work tirelessly to bring others to the tree of life. They become fellow servants with Christ and labor alongside Him in the work of redeeming others. This is one of the reasons for the parable of the busy young man in ten parables. See also the glossary entry, Atonement. Reim The word used by Joseph Smith to replace unicorn in the scriptures. It refers to an extinct species of wild ox, likely the aurochs or the Arabian oryx. Reins a biblical term that is often translated or used as heart or mind that literally means kidneys, pl, or loins, from the Hebrew. Kilia. And the Greek. Nephros. Meaning kidney, or, figuratively, the inmost mind. The reins are the seat of the inward feelings, emotions, and passions of man. Remember. Often used in the Book of Mormon to mean keep, see 1 Nephi 3, paragraph 27. Nephi used it in his record as a way of being asked if he kept the covenants of the Father, so far as they applied to him. The angel was inquiring about Nephi's worthiness to receive more and was asking, in other words, do you follow the Father's commandments? When Nephi responded, yes, the angel said, then I will show you more. Remnant. In 3 Nephi 9, paragraph 11, the Lord calls the Nephite audience and their posterity, this people who are a remnant of the house of Jacob this my people. It is important to know that the Lord describes them with this identity as my people throughout his sermon and prophecy. This careful limitation of the reference to the Lord's people should not be applied broadly. It does not include Gentiles. Mankind should not change his meaning. He is speaking about a single, identified group as my people, and it is those standing before him, as well as their descendants. Speaking to Nephi, the angel stated, Behold, saith the Lamb of God, after I have visited the remnant of the house of Israel, and this remnant of whom I speak is the seed of thy father. 1 Nephi 3, paragraph 23. Notice that the definition of the remnant to whom the prophecies apply has now been given. The distinction between the Gentiles and the remnant is apparent here. Nephi refers to the remnant variously as, descendants of his father, Lehi. See 1 Nephi 3, paragraph 23. Descendants of his brethren. 1 Nephi 3, paragraph 24. His family's descendants or our seed. See 1 Nephi 4, paragraph 3 and a mixture of Nephi's descendants who are among his brother's descendants. See 1 Nephi 3, paragraph 22. Although it would be impossible, without revelation, for someone to determine which of these lines a person might belong to today, the Lord, nevertheless, revealed in 1828 that these various divisions remain identified to him. See Joseph Smith History Part 10, paragraph 7. No doubt, in time he will restore to the remnant descendants this knowledge of their sacred paternity and eternal identity. Their blood may be mixed, but the remnant remains. Nephi may have referred to them more often as descendants of his brethren, but they have within them some of his blood, as well. In the day of redemption and restoration, the promises will all be fulfilled. The whole of the family of Lehi will be represented in the remnant. Repent, repentance. A change requiring believers to turn away from the world and toward God. It is the change in life that follows from seeing things in a better, truer light. There is another, higher way to live available to everyone. But to move upward, people must make changes in their lives to incorporate more light and truth. By living a higher way, they are repenting. This process is not a single event. It does not happen once. It should happen over and over as all increase the light in their lives. Repentance is granted by God. See Alma 10, 
paragraph 4, Alma 19, paragraph 15, and Acts 6, paragraph 9. It involves acquiring light and truth, meaning intelligence. Repentance is abandoning a foolish error, a vain tradition, or a false belief and replacing it with truth. Penitence is another way to describe repentance, or the process of change and growing beyond sins that limit your happiness. It comes as you allow Christ to succor you through the power of the atonement. Through penitence, people do away with the darkness in their lives and add light instead. Repentance is turning away from all other distractions to face God. To repent is to turn to Him. To turn to Him is to face Him, listen to Him, heed Him, and pay attention to what He is, says, and does. It is to seek to be in contact with Him. If one is in contact with Him, He will teach him all things he should do. See 2 Nephi 14, Paragraph 1 Constant contact between you and God can and will occupy your desires, thoughts and deeds. But turning to face Him is left to you. He cannot enter where He is not invited. He may want to be a part of your life more than you want Him to. It is your choice to let Him in. Hearing alone will not save you. Doing is the thing which saves.